Do you have time to stay current with the ever-changing medical information needed to treat your patients? With your busy schedule, there can't be much. That's why nurse practitioners need UpToDate, a medical solution powered by Walters Kluwer that provides accurate, evidence-based clinical information and treatment recommendations. You can trust UpToDate to make the appropriate care decisions for your patients. Subscribe to the growing network of over 2 million medical professionals worldwide who rely on UpToDate. Visit go.uptodate.com forward slash NP15. That's go.uptodate.com forward slash NP15 and use promo code NP15 to save 15% on a first time annual or longer individual subscription. In this episode of the Nurse Practitioner Podcast, Dr. Julia Rogers discusses acute care for COPD exacerbations. First, can you delineate between acute care for COPD exacerbation and chronic management of COPD? Certainly. COPD is the chronic and progressive course of emphysema and bronchitis. Chronic management consists of inhaled bronchodilators, both short-acting and long-acting, and as the disease progresses, inhaled steroids are added. Patients with COPD often suffer an exacerbation defined as an acute worsening of respiratory symptoms resulting in additional therapy. An exacerbation is often identified as an episode that increases the baseline dyspnea, wheezing, and cough with purulent sputum production. COPD exacerbations have a negative impact on the quality of life of patients living with the disease. An exacerbation accelerates disease progression and can result in hospital admissions and death. While many times COPD exacerbations can be maintained in an outpatient setting, what I will focus on today is the acute exacerbations that have failed primary treatment and the patient is seeking care in an acute care setting, such as in urgent care or in a hospital. What are the main causes of outpatient treatment failure for COPD exacerbation? There are four reasons that outpatient treatment for exacerbation of COPD fails wrong dose, wrong duration, wrong antibiotic, and not determining if oxygen is needed. First, the wrong dose or wrong duration is prescribed for the patient. When a patient is suffering from an exacerbation, it is important to identify the correct dose of medications, including inhaled bronchodilators, steroids, and antibiotics. For example, if a patient has repeated exacerbations and there has been a recent exacerbation, then the patient should be put on a steroid taper in lieu of just a three-day dose of 40 milligrams, because likely the patient has already failed this dose with the last exacerbation. A patient can often have a rebound exacerbation when steroids are abruptly stopped. A patient can also have rebound if the wrong dose or duration of inhalers or nebulizers is prescribed. Sometimes, while the correct dose has been prescribed, the patient is not getting the correct dose of inhaled medication because of the inability to use the inhaler or nebulizer correctly. This can be caused by not being well educated on the use or from the patient having increased bronchial constriction that not enough medication is being penetrated. Patients also have the tendency to stop using the increased frequency of inhalers or nebulizers when they begin to feel better, which increases the risk for a rebound exacerbation. Another cause of treatment failure is using a low dose antibiotic instead of a higher dose. Certainly, this happens more when an antibiotic is prescribed for a second time within a short amount of time. It can also happen because the antibiotic prescribed does not cover the microbe or it does not eradicate the microbe completely due to a short duration. Finally, not assessing the patient's oxygenation needs at rest and with a six-minute walk test in the outpatient setting can lead to missing a patient's need or requirement for supplemental oxygen. What are some of the differential diagnoses a nurse practitioner should be thinking about? Some differential diagnoses to think about are asthma, pneumonia, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, pulmonary emboli, pulmonary edema, TB, and cardiac disorders or arrhythmias. Fortunately, many of these common comorbid conditions can be ruled out or ruled in with simple non-invasive diagnostic tests. 
In the case of pneumonia, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, and pulmonary edema, a chest x-ray or ultrasound is quite helpful in making these diagnoses. Obtaining blood for a CRP or procalcitonin can also be useful in differentiating pneumonia, while cardiac enzymes are helpful in ruling out a more serious cardiac condition. And finally, an EKG can determine if a patient might be having AFib or another cardiac arrhythmia. Explain the clinical manifestations of a COPD exacerbation and how these differ from chronic COPD. In the GOLD guidelines, an ABCD assessment tool is used that assesses symptoms, breathlessness, spirometry classification, and risk of exacerbations to classify patients according to the following groups. Group A has low risk and less symptoms. They are stage one or stage two, and they have one or fewer exacerbations per year with no hospitalizations. The Modified Medical Research Council, or the MMRC, is zero to one. Or the COPD assessment test, also known as the CAT, is also less than 10. Group B has low risk but more symptoms. They are also stage one or stage two with one or fewer exacerbations per year and still no hospitalizations. Their MMRC is two or higher with a CAT of 10 or higher. Group C is high risk and less symptoms. They are stage three or stage four with two or more exacerbations per year and one exacerbation requiring hospitalization. The MMRC is zero to one or the CAT is less than 10. Group D is high risk, more symptoms. These patients are stage three or stage four. They have two or more exacerbations per year with one requiring hospitalization. The MMRC is two or higher with a CAT of 10 or higher. The clinical manifestations of exacerbation include worsening dyspnea, increased sputum production, and a change in sputum color with increased wheezing, fever, and weakness. When should a patient be admitted to the hospital? And to go a step further, when should a patient be admitted to the ICU? According to the guidelines, patients require hospitalization if they have a sudden or worsening of severe symptoms, resting dyspnea, tachypnea, desaturation, confusion or drowsiness, acute respiratory failure, and the onset of new physical signs such as cyanosis, peripheral edema, or failure or a poor response to the outpatient initial medical management of the exacerbation and presence of comorbidities such as heart failure or new occurring arrhythmias. Patients should also be admitted to the hospital if they have insufficient home support. The next question is when does a patient need to be admitted to the intensive care unit for treatment of a COPD exacerbation? According to the guidelines, patients require ICU care if they have severe dyspnea with inadequate response to the initial emergency therapy, changes in mental status such as confusion, lethargy, or coma, persistent worsening of the hypoxemia with a PaO2 of less than 40 millimeters of mercury, or severe or worsening respiratory acidosis with a pH of less than 7.25. Also, if patients are not doing well despite supplemental oxygen or non-invasive ventilation. Patients should also be admitted to the intensive care unit if they require invasive mechanical ventilation or if they have hemodynamic instability and a need for vasopressors. What are the important diagnostic tests that should be ordered for a patient with COPD exacerbation, and how does this differ if the patient is being treated in an outpatient setting versus an inpatient setting? The nurse practitioner will need to assess the severity of symptoms by determining the classification of the exacerbation. Mild exacerbations can be treated as an outpatient with short-acting bronchodilators with no diagnostic testing. A patient with recurring exacerbation or with a moderate or severe exacerbation should have a chest x-ray, CBC, BMP, ABG, a C-reactive protein, vitamin D level, and sputum culture. 
The chest X-ray will either rule in or rule out pneumonia. The CBC is used to determine leukocyte and hemoglobin counts. The BMP will identify any electrolyte abnormalities and the ABG will aid in determining the severity of acidosis and respiratory failure. The CRP is a biomarker of airway obstructions, but remains controversial, as does the procalcitonin, which is an acute phase reactant that increases in response to inflammation and infection. Finally, sputum cultures determine bacterium. If the patient is hospitalized, then certainly an ABG would be warranted. Other diagnostic testing would be determined on an individual basis. What is the treatment plan for a patient with an acute exacerbation of COPD? According to the GOLD guidelines, the goals of treatment for COPD exacerbations are to minimize the negative impact of current exacerbation, prevent subsequent events, reduce symptoms, and reduce risks. Let's take a general overview of the risks and benefits of the mainstays of therapy for exacerbations. During an exacerbation, patients are prescribed bronchodilators, steroids, antibiotics, and oxygen if needed. The benefits of bronchodilators are that they improve lung function, but that comes with the risk of having low bioavailability, side effects such as pharynx irritation and possible adverse reactions. For a patient that has been on bronchodilators as an outpatient, an increase in the dose and or frequency is often prescribed for the short-acting medications. Also, combining short-acting beta-2 agonists with short-acting anticholinergics should be considered. The nurse practitioner would consider using spacers or nebulizers for better inhalation and improved bioavailability. Finally, consideration should be given concerning the use of long-acting bronchodilators once the patient is stable. Steroids decrease inflammation in the bronchial tubes and have the benefit of shortening recovery, improving lung function, specifically the FEV1, improving oxygenation, and decreasing the risk of relapse and treatment failure. Also, they provide an overall decrease in hospitalization duration. There are some risks, and those include hyperglycemia, anxiety, and insomnia. Depending on the mode of delivery, other risks are pneumonia and oral candida. Oral corticosteroids should be initiated at a dose of 40 milligrams daily for a duration of five days. While new recommendations do not require a tapering dose, if a patient has failed outpatient treatment, a tapering dose should be considered. The administration of oral corticosteroids rather than intravenous corticosteroids is recommended if the patient is able to tolerate oral administration. Another alternative to oral steroids is inhaled budesonide. If the patient cannot tolerate oral or inhaled steroids, then intravenous should be initiated. Inhaled steroids are often in combination with a bronchodilator. A long-acting beta agonist in combination with an inhaled corticosteroid for 10 days should be initiated at the onset of an upper respiratory tract infection. Inhaled steroids do not work quickly, and so they can take a week or more before noticeable benefits. This is why during an exacerbation or worsening of COPD symptoms, steroids are given by mouth in a pill form or by IV because they act within 24 hours and provide a higher dose of steroid than the inhaled form. The patient should transition to inhaled corticosteroids as soon as possible before hospital discharge. Make sure to monitor for side effects of the inhaled steroids, such as sore throat, hoarse voice, and infections in the throat and mouth. Things to do to avoid or reduce these side effects include ordering the patient to rinse their mouth after use or gargle after taking the inhaled steroid. Also, ordering a spacer or holding chamber to reduce the amount of steroid landing in the oral mucosa. Patients with COPD who use inhaled steroids, especially those with severe disease and who are at advanced age, may have a higher risk of pneumonia and should be monitored closely. 
Antibiotics remain controversial for the treatment of COPD exacerbation. The evidence does support the use of antibiotics for moderate to severely ill patients with increased cough and sputum purulence. The benefit to antibiotics is that they shorten recovery time, reduce treatment failure, and they reduce the risk of early relapse. It is worth noting that antibiotics have improved benefit when they are prescribed specifically for patients with purulent sputum. The risk, of course, is increased resistance to the antibiotic as well as GI side effects, such as nausea and vomiting. The duration of antibiotics should be between five and seven days. Also, consideration to mucolytic medications. Mucolytics help to remove secretions from the lung by thinning the mucus in order for the patient to more easily cough it up. These medications are for patients with frequent flare-ups. Mucomus can be used as a nebulized solution while mucinex is in pill form. Also, consider phosphodiesterase for inhibitors. These are a type of oral medication that decrease inflammation in the lungs. This pill is used for patients with a history of frequent flare-ups and a chronic cough with mucus. It prevents flare-ups and should be used alongside of the regular inhalers. Vitamin D has been implicated in the pathophysiology of exacerbations and should be assessed and investigated in any hospitalized patient with a COPD exacerbation and look for a deficient vitamin D level. If warranted, supplementation should be given. The nurse practitioner must also monitor the patient's fluid balance and electrolytes. In the hospital, the nurse practitioner should also consider DVT prophylaxis with subcutaneous heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Finally, continue to treat other comorbid conditions that may also worsen with an exacerbation, such as congestive heart failure, and monitor the patient for new conditions, such as spontaneous pneumothorax, pulmonary emboli, or cardiac arrhythmias. Make sure to discuss smoking sensation and add a nicotine patch to the treatment plan for any current smoker. Finally, consider non-invasive oxygen as the first mode of ventilation used in COPD exacerbation with acute respiratory failure in any patient that has no contraindication to use. Can you elaborate on the oxygenation of a patient with COPD exacerbation? Oxygen therapy is a key aspect in the treatment of hospitalized patients for COPD exacerbation. Supplemental oxygen should be titrated to maintain a patient's SpO2 of greater than 88% at all times. An ABG should be done to determine patient's baseline and then repeated after initiation of oxygen or increase in oxygen demand in order to determine carbon dioxide retention and worsening of acidosis. There are multimodal oxygen therapies, including nasal cannula, high flow nasal therapy, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, and invasive mechanical ventilation. Indications for non-invasive mechanical ventilation include at least one of the following. First, respiratory acidosis, defined as a PaCO2 of greater than or equal to 45 millimeters of mercury and a pH of less than or equal to 7.35. Secondly, severe dyspnea with respiratory muscle fatigue, increased work of breathing, accessory muscle use, paradoxical abdominal motion, and intercostal retractions. And thirdly, persistent hypoxemia despite using supplemental oxygen. The benefit of non-invasive ventilation is improved gas exchange, reduced work of breathing, decreases hospital length of stay and ICU stay. It also increases survival rates and reduces the need for intubation. It can decrease complications of overall therapy. Once patients improve and tolerate at least four hours of unassisted breathing, non-invasive ventilation can directly be discontinued without any weaning period. 
Invasive oxygen with intubation has many more risks, including increased infection, length of stay, and mortality. Indications for invasive mechanical ventilation include the inability to tolerate non-invasive ventilation or having the patient fail non-invasive ventilation, a patient that is status post cardiopulmonary arrest, patients that have decreased consciousness or psychomotor agitation, any patient that is aspirating or has persistent vomiting, or a patient that has the inability to remove their respiratory secretions on their own. Also, invasive mechanical ventilation should be for hemodynamically unstable or hemodynamically unresponsive patients to fluids and vasoactive medications. Finally, patients requiring invasive mechanical ventilation include patients that are having ventricular or supraventricular arrhythmias or have life-threatening hypoxemia. How should a nurse practitioner determine antibiotic prescription? COPD exacerbations requiring antibiotic prescription include three cardinal symptoms. First, increased dyspnea. Second, increased sputum volume. And thirdly, sputum purulence. Also, any mechanically ventilated patient should be prescribed an antibiotic. If indicated, antibiotic therapy can shorten recovery time, reduce the risk of early relapse, and reduces treatment failure. It also reduces hospitalization duration. The duration of antibiotic therapy should not exceed five to seven days. The choice of antibiotic should be based on local resistance patterns. Usually, initial empirical therapy is amoxicillin clavulinate a macrolide or tetracycline. It is recommended that oral antibiotics be used. However, the route of administration depends on the patient's ability to eat, swallow, as well as the pharmacokinetics of the antibiotic. Antibiotic choices include macrolides, cephalosporins, doxycycline, trimethoprim, and sulfamethoxazole, or again, initially amoxicillin clavulinate. For people who have frequent COPD exacerbations despite being on bronchodilators and inhaled steroids, long-term use of antibiotic has been used. Azithromycin is that antibiotic of choice. Antibiotics overall have been shown to decrease the number of exacerbations. What are other non-pharmacologic therapies a nurse practitioner can use in the treatment of COPD exacerbation? Some non-pharmacologic therapies that must be included in the overall management of COPD exacerbation include smoking, cessation, and offering the patient aids in order to help them quit smoking. Also, offering pulmonary rehabilitation once the patient is stable. Vaccines should be discussed with the patient, including influenza, pneumococcal PCV14, and PPSV23. For all patients greater than 65 years old, with the PPSV for all patients less than 65 years old with a significant comorbid condition. And currently, the COVID-19 vaccine should also be included. Utilization of a home-based management model reduces the number of hospital readmissions and possibly mortality in patients with COPD exacerbations. One of the most important things we can do for our patients is to educate them. We should educate them on appropriate inhaler use, also on how to avoid flare-ups by taking medications as directed, avoiding triggers such as smoking, scents, cold air, and pollution, both indoor and outdoor, instructing patients on eating right and staying hydrated, also getting enough sleep and staying away from ill persons. Patients also need to recognize the early warning signs of a flare-up, so educate them about watching for symptoms that last longer than 48 hours, having increased fatigue or increased shortness of breath, having increased cough or a change in the mucus color, the amount or the viscosity. Also have them monitor for fever, sore throat, swollen ankles, or a need for them to sleep sitting up instead of lying down. 
COPD flare-ups can begin suddenly and quite unexpectedly. That is why a patient must know and follow a COPD action plan promptly. When should a patient follow up? First, discharge criteria must be met, and this includes reviewing lab data, initiating maintenance therapy with long-acting bronchodilators as soon as possible before the hospital discharge, making sure that the patient knows appropriate inhaler technique. Initiate the withdrawal of acute medications such as steroids and antibiotics. Also, assessing the need for oxygen by ordering a six-minute walk test. Management plan needs to be put in place for the comorbid conditions and making sure that all abnormalities have been identified and addressed during the hospitalization. Before discharge home, educate the patient on any changes that have been made to his or her medications. This can mean different doses or new prescriptions. Also, remind the patients how long they need to take each medication and when that dose may be lowered or when the patient can stop taking the medication. Within two to three days of leaving the hospital, the patient should call for a follow-up and then make a follow-up within four weeks of discharge or sooner if the patient needs closer follow-up care. Additional follow-up at three months is recommended in order to ensure stability of the patient's symptoms, lung function, and prognosis. This podcast does not constitute medical advice and should not be taken as such, and does not replace professional judgment or advice. The ideas and viewpoints expressed in this podcast do not reflect the official position of the speakers, authors, affiliated organizations, the Nurse Practitioner Journal, or Walters Kluwer.